Welcome to America's Heroes Group. And welcome back to America's Heroes Group. And this time with our roundtable community outreach with the NADCP. That's the National Association of Drug Court Professionals. August is National Wellness Month. Saturday, August 27th, 2022, our host is Cliff Kelly. My name is Sean Claiborne, the co-host. Our executive producer is Glenda Smith, and our digital media producer is Ivan Ortega of Scouts Honor Productions. And we have an exciting new panelist with us today. That's Christopher Deutsch. He's the director of communications for the National Association of Drug Corps Professionals, the leading treatment court training membership and advocacy organization. And we're going to talk about the mission and purpose of that organization and also an upcoming conference that we have coming up with this organization. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me. Our pleasure. So tell us, tell us first, about, first of all, what is drug court, and then also, well, that's t- a great- and then, but then also go into the different details of veterans court, how that pertains DWI court, which kind of all get lumped in together. That's a great question. You know, I like to think of drug courts and other treatment courts as like the best kept secret in the justice system because the fact of the matter is these programs have been around since 1989. So in Miami-Dade, Florida, late 1980s, um, the justice system is overwhelmed with people coming before the courts with substance use disorders, mental health disorders. And judges are trying a couple of things. They're going to be lenient, and the folks keep coming back. They're trying to be harsh, and the folks keep coming back. And so they're throwing up their hands and saying, what can we do to help these folks so that they, we stop the revolving door? And what they came up with was drug court. And the idea was pretty simple, but but quite radical. It was to take all of the stakeholders, the judge, the prosecutor, the defense attorney, case managers, probation, law enforcement, and have them work as a team. And then bring in treatment providers and folks to help with other recovery support and get them all working together to assess these folks, figure out what they need, get them treatment, support them, and get them on a path to recovery. And the spark that was lit in 1989 uh, took off around the country because all over the country, folks were equally frustrated. Um, And here comes something that works, drug court. Um, So drug courts began to expand very rapidly, and pretty soon people started to realize that the model could be adapted to serve other populations. So in the late 90s, we saw DWI courts for folks who had repeat DWI offenses. Um, We saw juvenile drug courts, family drug courts for uh, situations where children have been removed from the home due to parental addiction. And then in the 2000s, around 2008, a judge up in Buffalo, New York, uh, who was a drug court judge and a mental health court judge, began to see an increase in the number of veterans who were coming through his court dockets. And he started to ask himself, boy, what these folks have very specific clinical needs, social needs. Uh, It's a very specific culture. What can we do to support them? And it's interesting. He had a Vietnam veteran in his mental health court, and he had been trying for weeks to reach this gentleman, and he was unresponsive. And one day in a moment of exasperation, Judge Robert Russell tells his court coordinator, who was also a Vietnam veteran, and another member of his staff, he says, guys, can you take this gentleman out in the hall? Maybe you can reach him, vet to vet. They take the guy out in the hall. They talk for about an hour. And the next time the judge calls the case, the gentleman stands at parade rest. Mm. And Judge Russell says, are you willing to accept the help we're offering you? And the guy says, yes, sir. And at that moment, Judge Russell realized there is a therapeutic element to the camaraderie that exists among those who have served. And he began to work with his team to set up what became the nation's first veterans treatment court based on the drug court model, but specific for veterans, veterans only docket, brought in resources from the local VA medical center and really set up a place where the veterans felt comfortable accepting help and supporting one another. And Fast forward to today, and uh, we are well over 400 operational veterans treatment courts in the United States. Well, I think that's a really powerful thing to focus on the treatment versus on the punishment, because the the Mm -hmm. punishment just leads to recidivism. It doesn't really fix the problem at all. It just leads to the same problem back and back again, which costs more money 
And you and what I've been understanding is when you're doing this type of work that you're doing, when you're using drug courts and veterans courts, it actually is a fraction of the cost of the criminal court system. So we're saving money as taxpayers, but at the yeah. same time getting better results. You're exactly right. It's, it's one of the reasons these have such strong bipartisan support. Uh, it's partly that cost saving element. But but you're so right about punishment. You know, this country We've experimented with the notion of trying to punish our way out of these issues. And no matter where you fall on the political spectrum or the ideological spectrum, we can all acknowledge that it has not worked. Mm, right. You know, uh, uh, lock, lock them up, throw away the key has not worked. What people need is treatment. You know, we often talk about treatment courts or drug courts, veterans treatment courts as a combination of accountability and compassion. It doesn't mean that people are going to get a get out of jail free card or they can continue using and, and go about their business. No, they're held accountable. But that accountability comes in the form of confronting their issues through treatment and doing the difficult work of getting their lives back on track. And when you give people that opportunity, um, you know, you'd be amazed how how their lives just transform. Um, no, so it's, it's a radical. Before you go, new I want to approach. talk about that point right right there because. The one thing that I've that I've read about, and also reading reading the information that you sent, it's not an easy thing. It's not this is not a get out of free jail card. I wanted to go on that and kind of go back into that a little bit more because when you sign up for this, you are making a commitment and you're going to be held accountable for this. That yeah, that's exactly right. You know, early on um, when drug courts were first getting off the ground, I think there was a lot of pushback from folks who said, "Wait, wait, wait a second, we're." We're helping these people. Well, you know, no, no, they, they're criminals. They belong in jail. And, and what drug courts proved is that accountability or justice can look very different. We, we, we don't have to bind ourselves to this very narrow view of justice being punishment. Um, you're exactly right. You know, when someone joins, uh, uh, enters a treatment court, they have to agree to, to uh, the rigors of that program. And it is rigorous. They're going to appear, appear frequently before the judge to have their progress reviewed. They're going to go to treatment. They're going to go to meetings. They're going to have a case manager. Um, as they move along the program, they may be asked to start looking for employment. Um, and along the way, they are dealing, coming to terms with really serious substance use and mental health disorders. And anyone who knows anyone who has struggled with those issues knows, you know, kicking addiction that is, that is not easy. That is not for the faint of heart. And and it is not an easy road. And um, and so any notion that this is somehow more lenient, I think, is is really um, uh, a misunderstanding of, of what this is all about. And and, you know, the other thing I'll add is um, these are lengthy programs. You know, folks are usually in for 12, sometimes 18, sometimes 24 months. And what we found, what the research shows, is that's really the length of time it takes for someone to get their life back. I mean, you're talking people who have been, uh, in some cases, out on the streets for 10, 15, 20 years. Hmm. Their health has deteriorated. Wow. Um, their, you know, their family's given up on them. Um, they don't have stable housing. And to repair that takes time. And so treatment courts allow for that lengthy period of time for folks to really rebuild. Hmm. Now, for people that um, suffer from PTSD, which is common in the veteran community, but also a lot of research shows that people also who are not necessarily veterans may have uh, symptoms of PTSD or exhibit the PTSD from maybe even childhood trauma or their environment. So how does that play into the treatment process of going through the programs? That's such a great question because the fact of the matter is most of the people who come through a treatment court of any kind are dealing with some sort of trauma in their life that that may manifest in PTSD or in other ways. And so, um, you know, one of the benefits of a, of a treatment court is that they're bringing in all sorts of treatment providers based on the clinical needs of that individual. So when a person gets referred to one of these programs, they're going to get a clinical assessment and that's going to help inform, you know, what does this person need? Do they need strictly in, uh, inpatient addiction treatment? Do they need um, mental health support? Is there PTSD there? And then the court's going to go out and connect them to that treatment because it's not enough, as, as you correctly point out, you know, you can't just address the substance use disorder if behind that 
there is some sort of mental health issue going on and you, you you've got to you, you've got to treat them both um and in most cases most people who come before the programs have some sort of co-occurring disorder and and a lot of times in veterans treatment court the substance use is really the self-medicating to mask some of the mental anguish that they're going through and and so it's peeling back those layers and, and really treating all aspects of the individual. Mm-hmm. And to be clear, so if a person, um, and it's not something you can just sign up for, that you have to be selected, is that, is that correct? Y- y- yes, you, you've you got to, uh, these are for folks who are justice involved. Okay. And so, so, if you um, have, so, the, just, so it's and, not like the person, an attorney can't say, well, we're going to try to get them into this. So how does that part work? So if a person's arrested, and say they have a they did a serious crime and they want to make an appeal to the judge. Hey, I want to turn my life around. Can I go to yeah. instead of doing this? Can I go to to a drug court or a veterans court instead? Yeah, yeah. So typically it's going to be the attorney, but you know it, it's amazing, especially in, in communities where these programs have really um, become a bit of a mainstay. You know, uh, sometimes it's a family member. I, I was meeting with a guy who graduated uh, drug court 15 years ago, and I said. Hey, would you, he never told me, how did you get in the program? He said, I was sitting in jail. I assumed I was going to be locked away for a long time. Wow. And my mom said, wait, there's a drug court. We should try to get you in it. Mm. So these referrals can come from lots of different places. But the, the, the long and short of it is, if someone, it looks like someone may be eligible and that referral is made, they'll get assessed. And um, first and foremost, these are treatment courts. So they're really should be for folks who have a clinical diagnosis of either an addiction or a substance use or a mental health disorder or some sort of trauma. Um, and then and then there's some eligibility requirements around whatever the criminal activity is. But what's really interesting is that the research shows the people who do best in a treatment court, particularly a drug court, are the people with the more serious criminal histories wow. and the more serious substance use disorders. In other words, it's not necessarily the best program for that, you know, first time offender mm. or the, the kid in their early 20s who's experimenting with drugs and gets kind of caught up. Um, these programs work the best for the folks who are 10, 15, 20 years into their issues wow. and have been in and out of the justice system and may be facing lengthy incarceration. Well, that's I think that is the thing. Is, I think because people hit the rock bottom and that's just what and they just got to they just say, I can't keep doing this. Or is it? you know, man, this, my life is over if I don't, if I don't do this. I think, well, I think there's probably some of that. Um, I think it's partly because these are rigorous and intense programs. And like I said earlier, you know, um, you don't necessarily want to over-resource someone who may do better in a less intensive program or pre-trial diversion. Um, you don't want to over-resource them or overburden them in a treatment court. But for the folks who really need that sort of full 360 repair, Mm -hmm. um, you know, a year and a half, two year program treatment court is going to be right for them because it's going to take the time to build them back up and and get them, you know, reconnected, not only connected to treatment, but reconnected socially, Um, housing, employment, education, health. Some some folks need, you know, dental work. Wow court's going to help them with that you know it's really going to going to work best with the folks who um who have been struggling for a really long time one thing i thought was really interesting and this will break a lot of stigmas and i think stereotypes is that some of the people that are in these programs are not your you know we have the stereotype of a a guy laying out in the street somewhere in a gutter Mm -hmm. with a needle stuck in his arm and he's been robbing people and doing all kinds of horrible things you sometimes are accountants. You sometimes are lawyers. You mm-hmm. sometimes are doctors. You sometimes are CPAs that are they're doing crazy stuff to keep their addiction going or to keep their problem going, and they're just self medicating and doing really bad crimes, but not necessarily uh, anything that's violent per se to anybody, but serious crimes that can get them in a lot of trouble, and they're really on the path to destruction. Yeah, you're so right. You know, well, you know, there's one sort of misconception about these programs is that they're for sort of the low level. Um, you know, person who um, has a drug possession charge. Well, it's not really for them. But as you say, you know, there's folks who are facing lengthy criminal penalties for breaking and entering, check fraud. In some cases, particularly in veteran stream of court, that tend to take more violent offenses, um, assault, mm-hmm. um, you know, multiple DWIs, 
serious crimes um, where the only thing standing between them and the jailhouse is some sort of intervention like a treatment court. Um, but, but the other, I think you hit on a really good point too, which is that, you know, addiction, mental illness, um, these don't know any boundaries. You know, th- these, these things affect all of us. And particularly now, I mean, we, we are in the grips of an ongoing addiction epidemic. Um, it's sometimes referred to as the opioid epidemic, but frankly, at this point, it's bigger than that. Mm. Um, and you're exactly right. It's, it's not the preconceived notion of this sort of person you see shuffling down the street with a shopping cart. Yes, those folks are still coming into contact with the justice system and need help. Um, but it's also professionals and, and people of all walks of life and all socioeconomic backgrounds. And if they pass or go through the treatment, they will, can they, do they get expungements or did, how, what happens to their criminal record? It's going to depend on the court, uh, but typically there is an incentive involved to participate. And that would be that, um, yes, you're, you would get expunged at the end. Your charges would be reduced. You won't be saddled with a felony conviction. I mean, one of the real um, impetus for for driving these programs is that we know how destructive it can be for someone to um, try to get a job, try to find employment uh, or or education with a felony conviction. Mm -hmm. Um, And if we can hold people accountable, but support them and treat them and not saddle with them with that conviction, that's a really good thing. That's going to, you know, there's a number of factors that will make a difference between whether or not someone comes back into the contact with the justice system, but that's a big one. If they can, if they can be free and clear of those charges after they've done the work that the court has asked them to do, um, then why not set them on a path to success by, by freeing them from having that conviction? It seems like such a powerful, um, amazing, this groundbreaking idea to have a situation where you're basically taking people who are really problems in the community because even though they're doing it, they're not you know necessarily committing murder or child abuse or things like mm-hmm. that but they're mm-hmm. still a, a threat and a danger a person who was a repeat DUI offender a person who was mm-hmm. stealing money there was a Reddit article about a CPA who was like um, uh, somehow hustling oxycotton and because she had an oxycotton addiction the, I mean all these problems which are big problems to the community but instead of punishing the person you clear the path to get to the problem. So now that person has a clear path to be more productive in society, to do the right things in society. Now, is what's the next step of trying to expand programs like this across the, uh, the country even and even to reach more people? Is that something that's on the horizon? Yeah, you know, it, they continue to grow. Um, all told, we're well over 4,000 total treatment courts, which is great. I mean, that's you know, I think that shows that there's a real appetite out there at the community and state and and federal level um, for this type of approach. But we know we're not reaching the vast majority of folks in the justice system who really need it. And so you're exactly right that the the name of the game now is to continue to educate, to work with communities, to start um, investigating how they can uh, implement one of these programs. We need we need to raise the census of the total number of people who are involved in a treatment court. We estimate that it's about 150,000, which sounds like a lot, and it is a lot. Um, But there is, by some estimates, you know, a million to 1.2 million people involved in the justice system today who would benefit from a treatment court but don't have access. And And the one thing I'll add to that is what goes part and parcel to that expansion is expanding the treatment infrastructure in this country. You know, we spoke earlier about the addiction epidemic. Every single person in this country should have access to quality, affordable, evidence-based treatment. And in a lot of communities, whether there's a drug court or not, um, there may not be quality, affordable, evidence-based treatment, Mm. inpatient beds. Um, And so, you know, as treatment courts continue to expand, we need to also be thinking about that treatment infrastructure and how do we grow that and just get more, you know, how do we get more people into treatment before they're even involved in the justice system? Mm, I mean, that point, you know, Mm -hmm. ultimately that's the goal. Wow. That's a good point. So when, one of the things I also think uh, uh, we talked about, so it's vets, we want to talk first, let's make this this, this disclaimer. Vets typically studies show have lower incarceration rates. (laughs) 
So we do have Veterans Court, which is, I think, something um, is there's an honor to it to me because we're helping veterans, people that serve this country who have who have got demons from maybe their service, but also might have had issues before they got into the military. And we're helping to treat that, make them better, more productive citizens. And who knows, maybe they can go out and help other people. Um, So there's honor honor part to that. Um, But the thing is, is that this process is way more effective at reducing crime in general. Mm -hmm. Instead of having Mm -hmm. to, instead of going the punishment route, the treatment part of it. So what obstacles do you have besides infrastructure? We talked about that. But what other obstacles politically do you see that are in the way of helping this expand more? Will we start to reframe our idea about solving the problem? Well, you know, I'm I'm so glad you mentioned that uh, a, a couple of those really important points. It sounds a little cliche, but but this is truly a bipartisan issue. I mean, we see support for treatment courts in the deepest of red states and the, the bluest of blue states. Um, I think generally in this country, we are still working through, <coughs> excuse me, changing our perceptions around what does it mean, what, what does justice really mean? And I think all too often we are still very quick in this country to think of anyone in handcuffs as a criminal who deserves to be punished and that justice being served is punishment. (coughs) Excuse me. So there's still work to be done, I think, to, to change that notion. Now, how do we get there? Like, so what, what can we do as veterans? I think shows like this really help. uh, First of all, um, it's, I mean, and also, like we mentioned before, for anybody who does have the idea that, oh, we're just giving these people a free pass or a, a free second chance, you have to understand that it's that this is not an, the process. I've even read reports that people have actually chosen to go to jail when they try after trying to go through a treatment program. <laughs> so it, it was so right. tough. <laughs> they said, forget this. Right. I'm, I'd rather do my time in jail. <laughs> And I'll see right. you. I'll see you in court again someday. <laughs> so this is not e- an easy process. Well, and, and you know, I think I think a couple of things. One is the research shows it works. Mm-hmm. It works. I mean, it lowers recidivism. It it improves education. It improves employment. It improves housing stability, financial stability, family reunification, and it saves money. Now we don't always get behind in this country things that are proven to work right uh um so there's other elements too i think shows like this you know talking about this not running from these really difficult conversations around addiction and mental health around veterans issues um the more we can you mentioned stigma earlier you know the more we can talk openly and honestly about these issues um the more there's an understanding that they're treatable and people can overcome them. So I think sometimes not to interrupt, but so what's the, so what's missing then? So we so we started this about twenty years ago. So this has been around twenty yeah. almost thirty years now, so, and yeah. we you have about two hundred thousand people roughly in the in the program today. But you're saying there could be another million or so, or more, that yeah. could, this could be reaching. And we need infrastructure. Uh, we need you know we can't just put the courts in there and without the infrastructure in place, the infrastructure got to be provided. Where, how does that get laid out? How, who, when are we going to start building the infrastructure? What's the next step for that part of it? Well, uh, uh, you know, I think the pace of progress is actually, I, let's think about it this way, right? Prior to 1989, there was the idea of having tr- a judge, you know, trained on addiction understanding addiction and willing to work with a treatment provider on his team, his or her team in the courtroom did not exist. Hmm. And so I do think, you know, if we take a step back, that that incredible progress has been made in in, in the grand scheme of things with a short period of time. You know, that that idea that there are 4,500 to 4,700 communities in this country that have said enough is enough. We we now believe that people deserve treatment instead of incarceration um, is really positive. Um, now that said, you're right. We we've got to continue to um, to keep the pedal down and and keep the pressure on to grow these. One thing that I think does help is hearing from folks, not necessarily like me, but folks who have been through the program, people who have turned their lives around and are productive members of the community. Because when you start to think about that image that folks might have in their head of who's 
involved in the justice system or who has an addiction. And then we show them, well, this person is now a parent, an employee, paying taxes, being a neighbor, being involved civically. You know, the more we can tell these stories of success. I, I talked to a young woman um, two weeks ago. Um, she graduated, you know, she had a, a terrible addiction to opioids, graduated a drug court. They encouraged her to go to college to get a bachelor's degree. She did. Then she went and got her law degree. Wow. Then she passed the bar. Then she became a prosecutor in the same drug court that saved her life 15 years prior. And that's a remarkable story. But I promise you, I hear stories like that all the time. People who go on to do incredible things and incredible might just be being there for their kids and their spouse. But but people truly put their lives back together and, and live productively. And the more we can tell those stories, I think the more support there is for this type of approach. Last minute. So we didn't get to that point of your conference is coming up. So tell us a little about in one minute or less. What is this conference about and what do you get, want to get accomplished in this conference? Well, we had it, actually. It was in July. Um, I'm still recovering from it. We had 8,000 justice, you know, public health and public safety folks come to Nashville, Tennessee, 8,000. And they were there for one reason. They wanted to learn how to save more lives, do their work better, follow evidence-based practices. So we had a great four days. Uh, we tried to inspire them and send them home ready to continue their difficult work. Next year, we're going to be in Houston, Texas. We do it every year, and uh, it's called RISE, and you can go to nadcpconference.org if you'd like to learn a little more or see some pictures. But uh, it was a great event, and what it showed me is that there are folks all over this country who are deeply committed to this work and who, um, and who will continue to be on the front lines of these issues. Christopher DeWish, it's great to have you on the show, Director of Communications for the National Association of Drug Court Professionals. This is America's Heroes Group. We'll be right back. 